the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. It's 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day on this Thursday, March 10th. Here are the top market stories we are following for you at this hour. A hawkish surprise. The ECB says it may end its asset purchase program in the third quarter, drops the pledge that it will happen shortly before raising rates, ups its inflation forecast, cuts its growth one, bond yields jump, and markets bet on a 25 basis point hike in September. Right on the nose, U.S. CPI comes in exactly in line with estimates. The good news, it could have been hotter. The bad news, it's still another 40-year high. And that was before Russia invaded Ukraine and commodity prices spiked. And Goldman exits Russia. The bank becomes the first major Wall Street player to announce it's pulling out of the country as its war with Ukraine rages on. Meanwhile, talks between the Ukrainian and Russian foreign ministers in Turkey make no tangible progress. From New York, I'm Kaylee Lines with Guy Johnson in Frankfurt today. Alex Steele is off. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. Guy, it's a big day for geopolitics. It's a bigger day for economics and especially the ECB front and center right where you're standing. Absolutely. There was clearly some disagreements in the building behind me. Uh, the ECB governing council looks quite split. Uh, the statement very hawkish, I thought, certainly. Uh, and Christine Lagarde trying to push back on this, accelerating the idea that we are going to see an earlier exit uh, from extraordinary monetary policy. She talks about normalization, not tightening. But nevertheless, that's how the markets are priced it, Kaylee. You take a look at what is happening, for instance, in BTPs today. There is clearly now an accelerated expectation that the ECB is going to be tapering and tapering aggressively, then ending policy, and then fairly quickly after that, hiking rates. Yep, and spreads widening out in quite dramatic fashion today, Guy. And, of course, Christine Lagarde reiterating there is still a great deal of uncertainty posed by the ongoing war in Ukraine. Just listen to what she had to say about that in the news conference. GDP growth has been revised downwards for the near term owing to the war in Ukraine. Christine Lagarde speaking a few minutes ago in the building behind me here at the ECB Tower in Frankfurt. Let's get some more insight now into what happened today. Try and get a, a kind of read on the internals of the ECB right now. Its former chief economist is Peter Pret. He joins us now. Peter, can you decode what happened today? What happened in the press conference? What should we read into that statement? I think the, the, the ECB you know, wanted to give some signal that it cannot neglect, you know, the very worrisome evolution of inflation. So they wanted to give a signal. Uh, I personally would not have given that signal uh, by recalibration of the uh, asset purchase program. It's a kind of fine tuning, you see, where you, you recalibrate, you know, slightly in a way, but markets took it as a very strong signal, actually. And Christine Lagarde tried to downplay that signal by saying, you know, options are still open. Mm. I think it was not needed, actually, what happened today. Uh, I think the ECB could have kept, you know, the, the, the sort of tapering, which was already understood by the market. By, by this slight recalibration, I think they, they created a reaction in the market, which I think was, was not needed, actually. Well, and Christine Lagarde pushing back on the idea that this was an acceleration. She said that, in fact, it was not. But in terms of the language that they dropped, dropping the pledge to end APP shortly before raising rates, what do you in expect in terms of sequencing and the time frame between those two things? Well, the sequencing has not been changed. Uh, I think that was a good decision by basically saying that when you stop the APP, because that's now, you know, in the cards for for this year, uh, there should not be necessarily an increase of rates very shortly after. I mean, I could put it this way. And so they have more optionality. I think that was, you know, really something which was needed. I think the old formulation uh, in the guidance on rates was, was actually not good uh, the shortly before. So I think this change is, uh, I think is a good change, which increases optionality. I think, as I said before, I think it was not needed to slightly recalibrate, you know, the uh, asset purchase program because that sent a hawkish signal to the market. While when you think about it, it's 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 really marginal actually what you do and and coming with May June you know April May June you know, I think was really not needed and market took it barely actually with a with a you know tightening yeah. of of conditions actually. 
Yeah, we've seen a definite tightening of financial conditions uh, and Italy right at the center of that, Peter. What does that tell us, therefore, about the debate that is taking place within the governing council? Christine Lagarde, the statement, talked about that the ECB will do whatever, take whatever action is needed to fulfill the mandate. The mandate is inflation. Clearly, there are many on the governing council that are worried about that. What do you think is happening in the room? What's going on internally in terms of the debate? I think there, there are many different opinions. I think, uh, you know, some of the governors want to, you know, somehow get out of the negative rates, you know, without, you know, an excessive tightening of policy. And so uh, that, that's one part of the council, you know, trying, you know, to normalize a little bit, you know, what happens on the negative interest rate. Some other governors are indeed more hawkish. They, they focus on, on, on inflation. Inflation figures have been horrible and uh, then have not yet peaked. Christine Lagarde tried to downplay a little bit the figures by first reminding that when you look at 2024, inflation and core inflation remain below 2%, 1.9, which, you know, is, you know, the, the three conditions for hiking the rates are almost achieved, uh, and there is about 10 basis points before, uh, below the 2% uh, objective. I, I think uh, it, it, it's a bit messy, actually, when you look at the, the whole explanation, why 1.9 in, in, in 2024, and why do you need to recalibrate, you know, the APP now? Uh, I think, you know, it's, uh, there are many different opinions in the governing council. I think this is a little bit, I think, a criticism we could give, you know. We have an extremely severe shock. It's, yeah. uh, it's a sort of stagflationary shock. I can understand that the governing council has to send a signal that it cares about inflation, but it also has to care about growth. Well, and, and to, think, that, you know, to that yeah. point, Peter, as those inflation forecasts were going up, those growth forecasts were lowered. Is the ECB leaving too much up to fiscal policy with its actions today? I think, I think fiscal policy is going to be fundamentally changed in the coming years. I think that's a, that's a critical change in the environment of the central bank. So as I see it in the coming years, I think monetary policy is going to continue to normalize, but in a context where fiscal policy is going to support the economy. So there, there will be a very delicate balance uh, in what we call the policy mix between fiscal and monetary. Uh, and I think monetary policy will continue on the way of normalization. But my point today is that there was no need to start you know, giving a signal on the acceleration of you know, this normalization process, in spite of what Christine Lagarde was saying, this is an acceleration and, and understood like this by the markets before we know more about fiscal policy later on. So I think it was premature to come with, with, with this, in a way, relatively small recalibration, actually. Hey, Peter, you, 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 I, 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 and it is, but as you say, it's been amplified by the market. I, I just want to come back to it. You've said that this was not necessary. Why have we found ourselves in this situation? What is, just from a management point of view, is Christine, is, is Christine Lagarde in charge of the narrative here? Mario Draghi used to be in charge of the narrative. He would set the narrative and then he would wait for the governing council to fall in line. That doesn't feel like it is happening now. It feels like the governing council is split. There are clear hawks on it. And Christine Lagarde is having to sort of manage after the fact what is happening here. Well, it is, it is clear that uh, Christine Lagarde tries to give a fair account of the deliberations in the governing council and uh, which are the different views in the governing council. And Tristine Lagarde tries to, you know, communicate that. Uh, now, of course, the downside of this is that, you know, when you have different opinions, uh, the message is less clear. It's maybe a fair account of what the governing council people think, uh, but the message is less clear. Now, one must admit that the situation is extremely difficult for the ECB. Uh, but again, I don't think it was necessary to do that. How high is the risk of a policy mistake now, Peter? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that there's a big risk, you know, because the ECB is not going to tolerate, uh, you know, a, 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 tightening of, a significant tightening of financing conditions. So uh, they may push back, you know, as they did, unfortunately, in February, because we had already this experience of a tightening uh, after the press conference in February, and then a number of governors, including also Christine Lagarde, pushed back, you know, and then uh, rates went down, the spreads went down. Uh, then we had, of course, the, the Russian invasion. Uh, now we have this, I wouldn't call it hawkish communication, but I think the signal 
was taken as, as, as hawkish by the market. So that's a reality. And so I think they're going to push back, you know, in the other direction by saying, you know, that downside risk, substantial downside risk to growth. Uh, and so I, 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 I repeat, I think, I think it was unnecessary. All right, Peter Pratt, thank you so much for sharing some of your reaction to this ECB decision with us. He, of course, is the former chief economist of the ECB. Now coming up, we'll turn to the other big economic event of today, another CPI report out of the U.S., another 40-year high for inflation, and it's likely to rise even more. We'll talk with the founder and president of Inflation Insights, Omar Sharif, next. This is Bloomberg. So it wasn't just the ECB focusing on inflation today. U.S. February inflation data coming out bang in line with economists' expectations. I don't get to say that very often. <laughs> uh, the prices component coming through, 7.9%, Kaylee. Um, Mike McKee joining us to give us his take, Bloomberg's international and economics and policy correspondent. Mike, we don't often get economists getting it absolutely on the nose. This was, in some ways, a hot number. But I think the real takeaway from it was that it's going to get hotter. Oh, yes. And uh, Christine Lagarde today saying that it's the war that's determining the economy in Europe. Same thing here. But remember, it wasn't that long ago that it was COVID, the virus, determining the economy. Put them together and you get this kind of inflation. We've still got inflation hangovers from reopening the economy. And this is February, pre-war. And I'm trying to, you know use a historical comparison to what we're doing right now. So I put in Leonid Brezhnev. Everybody talks about Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. Brezhnev was the head of the USSR. The last time we saw any kind of inflation like this, and just look at this gap here, how high that inflation number is. We haven't experienced something like that in, as Kaylee said, 40 years. People aren't used to it, and it is going to cause some social political problems because it's not going to get any better. You take a look at what happened and what went up. Gasoline, 6.6%. You know that when you go to the pump and you see the prices. Here's the problem. This was February. So far in March, since the war began, gasoline prices at the pump are up 19% more. So that's going to be a real thing to watch in the next March CPI report. Food starting to go up as well. This doesn't seem like that much. Four-tenths for uh, owner's equivalent rent, basically housing. But it's been like the fourth or fifth month in a row that we have seen four-tenths. And it cumulatively adds up house prices contributing to the problems here. So how does the Fed look at this? Well, they know that a lot of this is war-driven and COVID-driven. They're going to be watching to see if the COVID stuff starts to fade out. And used cars did go down two-tenths this month, but they're going to be watching inflation expectations. Are these high prices going to drive people's view of inflation higher, and will they change their behavior? You can see what happened in the markets today. The markets are pushing up the one-year uh, to three-year uh, view of where inflation is going to be. And if that continues, the Fed knows it has a problem. Won't affect this month's Fed decision, but it could affect it in May if the markets decide that the Fed is really behind the curve. All right, Bloomberg's Michael McKee, great breakdown. Thank you so much. Let's get more on these inflation numbers now. We welcome Omer Sharif, Inflation Insights founder and president. So, Omer, The Economist nailed it right in line, but 7.9% is still really, really hot, even if not hotter than expectations. What's the March number going to look like? Uh, yeah, so let me sort of try to put that in perspective. Uh, you know, we had an eight tenths headline today. Um, if everything in the CPI next month was zero, except for gasoline, you would still be up around six or seven tenths just based off of what gasoline is going to do. So you're probably looking at a headline number next month that's going to be around 1%, if not in excess of 1%. And that's just month over month. And that means the year-over-year -year rate is probably going to move further up, uh, you know, possibly around 8.3%. But I should caution, you know, today we're still, we still got about almost three weeks left in the month. So we have to see where gasoline heads. But right now, it looks like we're on track for almost about a 20% increase just in gasoline prices alone. Omer, the, the narrative was that the base effects were going to kick in fairly soon and as a result of which inflation would mechanically start to fall. That looks like it is getting pushed further and further out. And that implies to me that the underlying inflation that we're seeing at the moment is even stronger 
than actually even the headline number suggests. Is that the correct interpretation? So guy, I would actually say when it comes to the base effects, they are starting um, in April. So really it's gonna be with the April, May and June prints where we really get those base effects starting to flow in. Uh, last year, we printed about 0 0.8 in that second quarter. Um, so it's gonna be very hard to match that. I mean, granted we have printed about, you know, today was a 0.5, we've been around a 0 0.5, 0 0.6 the last four or five months, but it's gonna be tough to meet those 0.8 numbers uh, in the spring, of course, you know, we kind of have to see what the fallout is from, from the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but if we don't match those, then mechanically the base effects will really start to kick in in Q2. And then you have the story of, you know, what kind of relief, if any, do we get in the second half of the year? Um, and that's really kind of, you know, where we're more focused on is the second half. Omer, when looking at the different components, you already mentioned gasoline prices obviously could have a big influence in March. But when I look at others just from February, food up 1%, food at home up 1.4%. Obviously, there's the wheat situation when it comes to the bread basket that is Ukraine and Russia. What specific components are you going to be looking out for putting gasoline aside? Uh, yeah, you know, unfortunately, it's going back to the good story. Um, yes, we got some relief on autos today. I think we will get even more relief next month on, in the auto situation. But essentially, anything that you are transporting via trucking is going to potentially see price increases over the next few months. Um, and that's because as much as we're talking about gasoline, you know, diesel is the other big part of this story. Because diesel prices are also at a record. 75% uh, of the fleet in the U.S. that's commercial vehicles uh, uses diesel. And so anything that is shipped via trucking, you know, whether it's TVs, furniture, any of those sorts of goods items, uh, you could potentially see fuel sur surcharges come in uh, to play for delivery. And that means that, you know, if, if someone's paying more to have it delivered, at the end of the day, that could get passed on to the consumer. So I think we have to go back to the good side of it. Um, and even though we, it seems like we were potentially going to get some relief, you know, the next few months are going to be very tricky in terms of how that diesel pass through um, hits into transportation and how, what that means for what you're paying um, at stores for, for items like TVs and so on. Amir, let's wrap this conversation up uh, and talk a little bit about second round effects. What are you seeing in terms of the second round effects off these high inflation numbers? I'm standing outside the ECB right now. The Eurozone is not yet experiencing the same sort of wage numbers that we're seeing in the United States. Clearly, wage inflation is a factor right now. Just in terms of how this inflation is changing the U.S. economy, what are you observing? Yeah, so for right now, you know, wages have been moving higher. Uh, that's been, honestly, has sort of really kind of predated um, the inflation surge that we've gotten over the last several months. Uh, you know, we know wages were going up before. Uh, prices have also been moving higher. But, you know, what I'm really kind of thinking about going forward is what kind of an impact does this have on consumption? Um, obviously, wages have been moving up. And so people are essentially thinking, look, we should be able to absorb this because incomes are rising. And to some extent, that's true, but real wages have been struggling in part because of this move in energy for the most part. Um, so the question is, you know, does this sort of really hit consumer spending going forward? We already have a Q1 GDP growth figure that looks like it's going to be roughly flat. And even though that's mostly inventories, um, you know, we've got to sort of focus on domestic demand and say, does this really flow through? You know, I put out a note yesterday pointing out that even though this is, th these aren't record prices in terms of, you know, inflation adjusted data for gasoline, this is sort of the biggest two month shock we've had really since Hurricane Katrina in data going back 60 years. So this is definitely gonna hit people's wallets. And I, I really am paying a bit more attention to how does this impact spending uh, moving forward. Omer, oh, great stuff. Thank you very much indeed, as ever, for your fantastic analysis on what is happening with this inflation story that we're all paying so much attention to. Omer oh, Sharif, Inflation Insights founder and president. Thank you very much indeed. We're going to get back to the Russia story next. The first major Wall Street bank to leave Russia has made that announcement. It is Goldman Sachs. We're going to talk about that next. Uh, Shanali Basak is going to be joining us to walk through the implications of this for, for Goldman Sachs and the rest of Wall Street. That story next. This is Bloomberg. Another American business announces it's ending operations in Russia, and this one is a big Wall Street bank, Goldman Sachs. It's the first of the big Wall Street players to do so. Joining us now with more is Bloomberg's Wall Street reporter, Shanali Basik. 
Okay, so Shanali, they're pulling all their operations out of Russia. What scale and size of operations are we even talking about here? It's really interesting. For a bank like Goldman, it's very marginal. Goldman mm -hmm. only has about 80 employees in Russia, some of which are Russian nationals and some of which we have previously reported are moving to Dubai. And their investment banking operation, underwriting of IPOs and debt, is only about eighth in the league tables for the country, which equates to around $20 million. And all of this is according to my own sources. You know, the interesting thing here is Goldman compared to, for example, Citigroup, Goldman yeah. 80 employees, Citigroup 3,000 employees, it becomes a lot more difficult to untangle yourselves then. And not just from the country itself, but from the many multinational businesses you do business with that have some exposure to Russian companies or Russian businesses themselves. So if it may be easier for Goldman to unwind this than others, are we likely to see other big Wall Street banks following Goldman's lead here or no? Well, I think one major gorilla in the room here is J.P. Morgan, which of the of Goldman, Citigroup, and J.P. Morgan, it has not yet disclosed the size of its positions there, the size of its credit exposure there, and its employee base there. For Citigroup, one thing that's interesting is though they have limited their exposure, they also are trying to sell a consumer business where one of the major buyers would have been a potentially mm -hmm. a, a sanctioned entity such as VTB. So that's the complications in exiting the business itself. Plus. There's another thing that's going on in the background here, Kaylee, that I think is really important. A lot of these large Russian companies that have mm -hmm. relied on these big investment banks to issue debt are now at crosshairs with investors who are really worried about their debt repayments. Yeah. So Damien Sassauer and I this yeah. morning were looking through the CDS exposure, and it is enormous, the risk of default in a lot of these firms. And that risk is one that seems to be rising. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Shanali Bossett. Great Bloomberg scoop there. A few headlines crossing the Bloomberg terminal that I do want to point out. One, we're hearing from the president about the inflation data we got earlier today. He says inflation number shows the cost of imposing sanctions. But remember, this data was before the war in Ukraine even broke out, and we saw the sanctions put on place as a result. He also says it costs on Putin and his cronies much higher than the U.S. Then when it comes to the bond market reaction to that inflation print, the 30-year yield is now at its highest since May 2021 at 2.39%. More on the market reaction next. This is Bloomberg. We're an hour into the U.S. trading session on this CPI day. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle is tracking the market moves for us. Abigail, we're lower on equities, but not by as much as we were earlier. We are off the lows, although we're down nine-tenths of one percent after yesterday's big rally. And it's interesting, Kelly, because you and I were just talking about oil. What happened to oil? Not so long ago, oil was up four, five, six percent. Now it's uh, uh, up just one percent. We're not aware of any headlines influencing this. But as we've been talking about over the last couple of days, technically oil is very overextended. So it's not surprising to see it continue to perhaps come off of its highs. As we see here, though, a big story in the week bonds. This is pretty incredible. The 10-year yield backing up more than 25 basis on the week, sort of hidden to some degree by all the action in stocks and commodities. But this is critical, of course, after that CPI print, the highest in 40 years, a fresh 40-year high, plus the Fed next week. As for some of the movers beneath the surface for the S&P 500, Goldman Sachs is down, similar to other banks, even with yields higher. And, of course, Goldman is exiting its Russia business, as Kelly Guy and Shanali were just talking about. Apple down 2.9% of real weight. Amazon, on the other hand, higher on that 20 for 1 stock split. The optics better for retail investors and traders. Uh, perhaps the $10 billion, $10 billion buyback. And then ExxonMobil up 2.3% as oil tries to hang on to its gains. As for the S&P 500, one reason to think that yesterday's start of a relief rally could continue. We have a bullish divergence here for the S&P 500. This is not a long-term bounce, but a near-term bounce. Uh, that could actually be pretty difficult to uh, play. It would be pr probably prevent more present more of a sell the rip opportunity on the bottom we have the RSI you can see it's in this coil coming up in a series of higher lows suggesting momentum may go to the upside this as the S&P 500 is going down it points to the idea that you could see the bullish momentum bring the S&P 500 back toward that 200 day moving average guy right around I believe 46 uh, 44 67 uh, <laughs> or even higher 4500 4600 but again probably a near-term pop if it happens. Volatile markets. Abigail, thank you very much indeed. Let's talk more now about that volatility uh, and figure out how exactly 
you should position for it. Sarah Hunt, Alpine Woods Portfolio Manager, joining us now. Sarah, central banks, I, the, the central bankers here at the ECB, where I am today, certainly struggling to plot a course through all this macroeconomic volatility. What are you doing at Alpine Woods? How are you plotting a course through it? Well, as I said earlier in the break, I think that we were positioned already for trouble with central banks because you knew that the Fed was going to have to raise rates. You could see the inflation coming even before the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Unfortunately, besides from the horrible humanitarian toll, you've added to the problems that the central banks are facing because they are also looking at now higher energy prices, higher food prices, and a potentially protracted problem that is very seems very difficult to fix. You can see the markets reacting to any hope that diplomacy will be find some sort of a solution where clearly it did not. So I think that this is really just something that makes a very difficult situation worse. And I think that you're looking at higher commodity prices, higher food prices, higher input costs. That's difficult for central banks and for equity markets. So when we think about the equity market, as you say, it's reacting to each and every headline. Yesterday, the best day since 2020, which was only two days after we had the worst day since 2020. Would you be a buyer of any dips here, or is it too early to find a re-entry point, given the uncertainty out here? Well, it's been, I mean, you've seen a lot of sector rotation. So some of the sectors get to the point where you think, okay, you're starting to see some valuations that look reasonable. The industrial sector, which ran early, has come off quite a bit. And so I think that there's some opportunity there in the industrial sector. Some of the very high-flying stocks with very high valuations have also come off a little bit. I think it might be too early for some of them. We're certainly looking at some of that. But if you think of things like cybersecurity, that's only going to get, the need for that is only going to get worse as we move along. And I think that some of those areas, you might see some opportunity. I think it's difficult though, as you see the markets whipsaw back and forth, to be careful about entry points. And I think that that is the toughest thing to deal with right now, because after a long period of no volatility, we've got so much volatility. And just as you were mentioning earlier in the bond markets, yeah. that bond market yeah. volatility is very high too. So it's, it's a very different uh, environment than we've been in for the last several years. Okay, let, let's talk about entry points and let's talk about the energy and commodity sector, Sarah. It has done incredibly well thus far this year, but we've seen some real volatility there in energy prices over the last few days as well. Uh, if there was, uh, and this would be fantastic, uh, some sort of a ceasefire, I'm assuming energy prices would come down relatively quickly. Is it too late to put fresh money to work in commodities? Well, I think that energy prices would come down quickly. The question is, what level would they come down to? And I'm not sure that they're going to come down to a level that gives a lot of uh, freedom from lower gas prices and from lower energy prices in general. You already had rising energy prices before this happened, and a good deal of that is because demand got a lot better and the supply situation hasn't changed very much. That's partially due to the issue of trying to transition away from fossil fuels, but that's a very long tail. And I think that the curtailment of supply, even before this happened, was showing you higher energy prices. So I think that there are ways to, I think that there are, there is an ability to get into some of these energy stocks because I think you're going to have a longer period of time where energy prices are going to be elevated from the expectations a few months ago. Not to the extent that they are right now, if you get some sort of solution, but I think you're still going to have a higher, longer term energy price for the next 12 to 18 months than people were expecting even six months ago. Obviously, Sarah, energy, a classic cyclical, also value play, though it has gotten more expensive. In terms of what else is expensive, obviously there was a narrative that you wanted to shift out of growth this year. Is growth an area you might want to be getting back into, given valuations have come down, and do they present some kind of defensive opportunity? Well, it's interesting because last year there was a lot of discussion about tech stocks and whether or not they were defensive or they were growth stocks. And I think there's a combination there. I think that there are plenty of technology stocks that have a growth aspect that are also fairly defensive and have reasonable valuations. And I think that's what people are going to be looking for, looking for going forward. I think we're questioning whether the earnings on the P.E. ratio, we even know what they're going to look like this year because the input prices are moving so quickly. But I think that there are a lot of those technology style works that sort of got sold off in this that still look like they're not unreasonably priced. I mean, even some of the big ones, forget Amazon with its current stock split, but even Google, didn't. you know, it popped up on earnings, but then it came back. I think that there are places in those larger tech names that you can find some value here and that you can enter into. But I think it is going to be a very unusual year because we just don't know so much of the input side. All right, Sarah Hunt of Alpine Woods, we have to leave it there, but thank you so much for joining us. Now, coming up, we'll get back to one of the forces driving input costs higher, the war in Ukraine, putting the shipping industry's recovery in jeopardy. We'll talk with the CEO of Hapag Lloyd, Rolf Haben-Janssen, next.
This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Ritika Gupta, live in the principal room. Coming up, Jason Katz, the UBS Managing Director and Private Wealth Advisor, joining Bloomberg Television at 3.30 p.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. I'm Rishika Gupta. The House has sent a signal that both parties want stronger punishment of Russia for the invasion of Ukraine by an overwhelming majority. Lawmakers approved legislation barring U.S. Of imports of Russian oil. The vote came a day after President Biden used an executive order to ban Russian crude imports. It's not clear if the Senate will take up the bill. The UK has added seven more prominent Russians to its sanctions list, including the owner of Chelsea Football Club, Roman Abramovich. He, they face a full asset freeze and a travel ban. Plus, they are prohibited from doing business with UK citizens or businesses. The move effectively derails Abramovich's plan to sell Chelsea. And the war in Ukraine has the shipping industry braced for new shocks to its labor force. Ukrainian and Russian sailors make up nearly 15% of the industry's 1.9 million seafarers. They also make a high proportion of its officers and ranked crew. Now many of them can't get to their ships and those on board can't get home. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg Kaylee. Ritika, thank you. Well, the latest attempt at diplomacy in the war in Ukraine appears to have gone nowhere. The foreign ministers of the two countries met in Turkey in their first discussion since the war began, and Ukraine's foreign minister said Russia indicated it would continue attacks until its demands are met. Meanwhile, President Biden discussed the war in a call today with Turkey's President Erdogan. Joining us now for more on all of it is Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern, who is in Washington at the White House for us. Anne-Marie, the Biden administration clearly has already ratcheted it up its moves here. We have seen the action on energy. Now we understand it may be sanctioning uh, a nuclear power player when it comes uh, that operates within Russia and actually has a lot of business related to Europe as well. What does it do next with no sign that diplomacy is going to make progress anytime soon? Well, I believe, Kaylee, you outlined it there. They're just going to continue looking at ways to sanction the economy because it is hurting the Russian economy. All of these sanctions from the West, the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, Europe, Japan, all of this is starting to crimple, cripple the Russian economy. The stock market has yet to open. You see the central bank having to hike rates. The ruble is in free fall. And even without government assistance, you see companies just pulling out every day. There's a new company. There's been dozens now, the latest being Goldman Sachs. So this is certainly the path the U.S. is taking. When it comes to diplomacy, though, the U.S. has not engaged on an official level with Russia. But today we did see Olaf Scholz, the Chancellor of Germany, as well as Emmanuel Macron of France, take a call. And in that readout from the German chancellorship, what you heard is that they really were just imploring President Putin to start a ceasefire, to, uh, to bring these troops back and to end the bombing. Because we all see the pictures that are happening, especially the pictures yesterday of Maripol. But one note in that statement as well from the chancellorship was that they want to remain in touch on the next few days. Amory, what we are seeing is the West supplying weapons into Ukraine, but Ukraine wants fighter jets. And that's an area in which we have yet to see concrete progress in terms of aircraft in the skies operating in Ukraine. Now, those will be flown by Ukrainian pilots. They're likely to be aircraft that are going to come from Poland and potentially other nations as well. Are we going to see a significant escalation after we saw that bill being passed yesterday uh, in Washington in terms of funding this for weapons to flow even faster and bigger and more sophisticated weapon systems to be made available? So on the funding front, Guy, the Biden administration asked Congress for $10 billion. And what came through was $3.6 billion that the House voted on. And as you say, this is weapons, this is economic aid, this is humanitarian aid, because there's a huge humanitarian crisis. The U.N. saying some 2 million people already have fled Ukraine. So a fresh refugee uh, crisis in Europe. 
When it comes to those Polish jets, though, it is a little bit uh, precarious on how they would deliver these jets because the, in the simplest terms, no country wants to be the last ones to touch those jets, to be the ones that give them to Ukraine, because Russia would certainly take that as a latest provocation and potentially even meaning that NATO member has joined in this conflict. Amory, thank you very much indeed. Bloomberg's Washington, uh, Bloomberg's Washington correspondent, Amory Hordern. Uh, I want to pivot back to a, a story that we heard from Riddiker a few moments ago uh, when she gave us the first word news. The, the last story talked about the fact that the shipping industry is going to be significantly affected by what is happening here, uh, not only in terms of the routes uh, that the shipping industry uses, what's happening in the Black Sea, but also the people that crew those vessels. Many of them come from Ukraine and Russia. Joining us now is the CEO of Hapag Lloyd, Rolf Harbin Janssen. Sir, thank you very much indeed for your time today. How are your operations being affected by this conflict? What are you now seeing? I think what we see is that operations into Ukraine and Russia, of course, uh, suspended. Yeah, as soon as the um, war broke out, we basically suspended all bookings into both countries. And as a consequence of that, um, we today have no ships uh, that is of either one of them. Uh, and that means that the boxes that we have on board, we have to offload somewhere else. So is the Black Sea no longer safe for shipping, Rolf? That's probably too strong yeah, to say that. Um, we, at the time when the hostilities broke out, we had one ship in Odessa, and we've also been able to get that ship out. And that's meantime, again, I believe, out of the Black Sea. In terms of what is happening with crewing of vessels, uh, as we've been reporting, many of them do come from Ukraine and Russia. In terms of Hapag Lloyd's fleet, where do you get the largest bulk of your crew from? And the Ukrainians and Russians that are within the fleet, what is happening to them? Yeah, I think in, in our case, we're probably in a somewhat special position there because when we look at, at our own fleet, uh, which is well over 100 ships, the number of crew that we have from Russia and Ukraine is actually very, very small. That's a small double digit number. So for us, that's in, in fairness, not a big problem at this point in time. Well, obviously, there are a, a large number of problems stemming from this conflict, one of them being other supply side challenges, including higher commodity prices. In terms of when it comes to shipping rates, is this going to mean that they peak later? I know that you said that the second half is going to look a little bit better, but how much better? Difficult to say, of course, at this point in time. I, I still think that we start to see some, some signs that, that the global market is easing a little bit. Uh, I think we see a little bit less port congestion in, in a number of places. There's still quite a bit of it around, but I still think there are, good, there are some indicators that, that indeed in the second half of the year we'll see things getting better. Of course, when you now look at what happens with energy prices, I mean, to just give you an idea, I mean, the, the price of oil for us has gone up with about $500 a ton over the last couple of weeks. Uh, for us, that's on an annual basis between two and 2.5 billion extra cost. So yes, cost will go up. Nevertheless, I do still think that um, in the course of this year, we will start seeing the cost of shipping come down. You mentioned that we are seeing some ports starting to see some of the congestion easing. Can you just be a little bit more specific? Where are you seeing that congestion easing? We spent um, many, many shows talking about what is happening in Long Beach and, and the port of L.A., what is happening in China. Where do you see congestion easing and where does it remain? I think in, if we look at Asia, then over the last uh, six weeks or so, the situation has definitely eased. Um, so Asia in general at the moment is actually, again, in reasonably good shape. And also with COVID-related restrictions being slowly lifted, I think we're going to see a, a fairly stable situation there. If we look at the U.S., you're right, L.A. Long Beach is still an issue. Having said that, uh, we've had a time when there were over 100 vessels uh, in the queue. And the latest count I saw uh, a couple of hours ago was more around about 50. So I would also say that that's something that, that also signals that things are getting a little bit better. And it will still take time to get all the ships back on schedule. And the percentages in terms of schedule reliability will remain low for a while. But what we also see when we look at our data is that, you know, rather than being, say, seven days late or eight days late, we're starting to see more cases where we get seeing that come down to 
five days or six days. And whilst there are only small steps, I do believe that there are some early signs that we start to see things getting back to normal. It will still take time, but I'm a little bit more optimistic today uh, than mm. I probably was you know, three or six months ago. Well, speaking of things taking time, how quickly are you able to increase your capacity at Habeck Lloyd? Not very quickly. I mean, we have a we have a fairly big order book and those ships are starting to come in after summer. And after that, it's roughly going to be one a month for about uh, for about two years. But of course, it takes time for these ships to be built. And right now, there is basically no ship around the globe that's not occupied. I mean, if you look at the graphs on what is idle fleet, uh, it's been pretty much zero for the last year and a half. Rolf, you, you, you talked about fuel prices going up significantly. Bunk fuel prices have, have certainly increased dramatically. You talk about the fact uh, that delivery times and arrival times are starting to come in a little bit. Is there a temptation with high fuel prices to run ships more slowly? Not today, because today, you know, we need every ship to sail and to move as swiftly as we can. And our priority right now is definitely to get them back on schedule. So we will not slow down any ship just at the moment because the fuel price is high. Well, obviously, the reaction on the on the political level when it comes to governments in Europe, the higher fuel costs, this energy crisis is leading to an acceleration in the push to transition to cleaner sources of energy. Where does Hoppeg Lloyd fall within that? What efforts are you undergoing currently to maybe wean yourself off of fossil fuels and in regard to your carbon emissions? I mean, we, we see that we believe that there are several pathways that can bring us in that direction. On the one hand, we have a number of ships um, on order that are on dual fuel. That means that they could go either on LNG or on some kind of e-fuel that's, that's gas-based. Uh, we also believe that methanol and, and ammonia over time will be viable alternatives. The problem is, though, that they are not yet available in sufficient quantities. So as such, for now, we will need to make sure that we make our ships more efficient so that we simply um, consume less fuel. And then over time, we need to find ways to switch to different types of fuel once they become available. And I believe that in the end, there's going to be some kind of mixture between liquid gas, uh, methanol and, and ammonia. Rolf, final question from me. The, the subject that we're discussing today on this program is centered around inflation. Do you see inflation ultimately slowing the consumer down, slowing the consumer demand down, particularly for goods over the next few years. What's your outlook on inflation? What impact do you think it's going to have? It's a very tough question. Um, you know, if you if you look at history, then uh, then inflation tends to yeah to have an impact, especially if it's extreme. And I guess right now you'll see people probably being a little bit cautious because we see especially on when it's around energy costs and those type of categories, uh, costs go up very rapidly. Having said that, there's still so many savings out there that um, I'm still cautiously optimistic that when you look a little bit further out, that demand will continue to develop actually quite favorably. There's simply still too much buying power out there and, and all of the stimulus that has been there for the last two years mm. um, has also resulted in a lot of additional savings that at some point in time will come to market. Yes, that we know to be true. Thank you so much for giving us some of your time today. That is the Happy Lloyd CEO, Rolf Haben Janssen. This is Bloomberg. It's been a big day. While war rages in Europe, we've had two major macroeconomic events. On the one hand, you had U.S. CPI coming in, bang in line with estimates, but still at a 40-year high of 7.9%. As for how that's translating into U.S. equity markets, we are right around session lows. It is tech underperforming the Nasdaq 100 down two percentage points, the S&P by one and a quarter. You're seeing bond yields moving higher off the back of that data, up four basis points on the 30-year to 2.37%, which is the highest going back to May of 2021. On the other hand, in Europe, you have a surprisingly hawkish ECB. Christine Lagarde says it's not an acceleration of its stimulus exit, yet that is how the market is taking it. You have stocks lower in Europe by about 1.5% on the stock 600. The euro was stronger initially, now back to weakness. We're at 110 to the dollar, and you're seeing the biggest movement in the periphery, the 10-year BTP yield up 24 basis points to 191. We'll have more on the European close next. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.